Welcome to my world. Jewish cargo, pate, frisade, two green salads. Okay, then you start here. Lamb chop, steak sweet. Shouldn't you be doing something? Two full filet and a pepper steak. Come on, make the dessert. Chocolate tart, please. As a cook, tastes and smells are my memories. Now I'm in search of new ones. So I'm leaving New York City and hope to have a few epiphanies around the world. And I'm willing to go to some lengths to do that. I'm looking for extremes of emotion and experience. I'll try anything. I'll risk everything. I have nothing to lose. God help us, what we think of in America when we talk about Mexican food is again and again, you know, tomatoes, cilantro, a little jalapeno, the squirt of lime, gobs of sour cream, cheddar, and maybe Monterey Jack cheese sprinkled on top, some crappy refried beans. It ain't like that at all. There's a whole spectrum of flavors and textures and ingredients that most of us wouldn't know about. I came to Mexico to find this real Mexican food. Some places I can tell I'm going to like immediately. I'm going to like this place. I'm on my way to Oaxaca, a beautiful town with a very sophisticated, maybe the most sophisticated cuisine in Mexico. We're going to the Mercado, right? To the, the central market. Food market and grocery market. I've enlisted Martin, my driver, to show me the authentic side of Oaxaca cuisine. He's from Mexico City, so he's a city boy like me. We can buy some food and uh, and maybe buy a breakfast. And some chapulines. What's a chapulina? Grasshopper. Grasshopper. I don't know that I'm ready for that for breakfast. Uh, yeah, why not? Yeah. The Oaxacan market is filled with really gorgeous, surprisingly fresh stuff. It's a market that smells good, with a real variety of things going on. And like all the best markets, it's notable for its cool food stalls, where there's great stuff to eat. And this place is no exception. Chocolate atole is basically hot chocolate with a sort of cornmeal texture. Sort of like tapioca, but not as thick. It's almost like a breakfast porridge. And the bread's kind of like a... Kind of like a brioche. Like a, a sweet bread. If you stand in here long enough, you'll take on that original smokehouse flavor yourself. There's even a whole butcher section where there's meat available right then and there for grilling. You got sausages like chorizo and morcilla, and they'll grill it right up for you. This is pretty cool. This is very cool. Now, what's going on here? You, you, you should buy by a quarter, by a half, by a pound, by a kilo, mm -hmm. and uh, they can start grilling it for you. Right. Now I see over here somebody's got some, uh, looks like some big skin, big green onions going. Yeah, big onions. That's a chorizo there. That, this that. is the chorizo. Right. Just beef. Right. This is the amigo. Tripa. Ah, tripes. Mm, yeah, they're <laughs> eating a lot of tripes on this trip. I don't know. Hey, okay, we'll be back for this. Oh, the hell with it. Let's get a couple of chorizos. You can pick up your own vegetables and tortillas, whatever else you want to grill, right by the butcher station. So it's sort of a build-your-own sandwich joint. Many, many options open to you as far as which butcher you want to go to, which products you want to bring. It's fun. Sort of a kooky concept. Now, what should we do with these? Should we get something to eat with that or just a snack on it? No, we can have a tortilla or just a snack. I think just a snack. I want to get a little light eating this morning. So a corn of hot chocolate. Oh, yeah. Oh, that looks good. Look at all that nice red stuff coming out there. Oh, that's really good. Spicy, wonderful, oily, greasy, smoky. That's really good. What are we all? 12 pesos. I need a little time to regain my appetite, so we take a moment to check out the goods. I've pictured my floor staff many a time in exactly this position. Oh, yeah, okay. Here's where I'm really getting turned on, the chili section. Chile mulato, chihuacle negro. Pasilla mije. Chilo pasilla mije. Chile guajillo. You could do an entire 22-episode series just on the chiles. There's so many of them. Each has their own characteristics, some of which are very subtle. You know, various stages of one particular chile, you could get going a big discussion on that alone. I don't have the time or the knowledge to pursue that subject as fully as it deserves. What's the hottest pepper here? Habanero. These are dried habaneros. Dried habaneros. Okay, I need, a, I need a bag of those. Uh, my old friend Steven uh, has some pain on the way. Ah, grasshoppers. Okay, now, you have to put them in your mouth. Right. A little grasshopper, big grasshopper. Big grasshopper. And you just right go in? like that. Yeah? Very good. Where's the flavor coming from? They put spices? They put inside chapulín. Garlic, lemon, and salt. More bugs, grasshoppers. Big deal. Been there, done that. It's so last week. I have a few grasshoppers at this point. It's like eating potato chips. Lunchy. Muchas gracias. 
As if I haven't gorged on enough odd food already, our team tells me that the market has a place known for its menudo, or tripe soup. I think I need a bowl. It's everything inside. Make you strong? Very strong. Special for hangovers. That's one for you. Oh, yeah. That's belly, eye, all you know. Good. Heart? Oh, yeah. Extra heart. Yeah. Leg? The leg, right? Leg. Leg? Leg. Yeah. Uh, mouth? Oh, yeah. Mouth. Good. Lips. Lips. Belly. Belly. Good. Liver. Liver. And head. Menudo is a lot like peasant dishes in other countries. Little strange bits of meat, some crunchy vegetables, and some hot broth to warm it up. Wow. Oh, yeah. There you go. That's a meal. That's good. Yeah, you got this little lime. A little more chilies. I like it spicy. This, nuclear. Oh, there's a little for a snouter. The menudo is incredible. It may look like something from Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but the dramatic variety of textures taste great floating around in the spicy, meaty broth. That singing group of adorable tanks is named after a big heap of steaming guts. It's true. I can't be within 500 miles of sun and sand and not spend a day at the beach. So I beg Martine to take me to the coastal town of Puerto Angel. It's like a swordfish because it has the head cut off. Puerto Angel is a fishing community. Fine day. Cleaned up, ready to go. Looks good to me. Lunch. As in so many fishing communities, people recognize the boats from way out. As soon as a boat comes in, they come in quick and everybody runs to get the best fish. Some of this goes to the market for wholesale. A lot of it is just bought by the locals to bring home and take care of their own fish needs. Since I was at the beach, I decided to go snorkeling, which seemed like a good idea at the time. In case we need to cook something, we need a lighter. I got one. But now, looking back, it was just another pointless venture in television entertainment. The plan was to have the buff, brown, and studly Chef Bourdain go diving into the water and come up with a snapping, monster-sized fish, followed by a photogenic scene of me grilling fish in a woolly sweater on the beach over an open fire. In fact, it was a spindly, pencil-necked, flabby-assed, and semi-nauseated Chef Bourdain tenuously wading into the freezing water with a wiry Mexican guy named Leo. He basically line fishes while snorkeling. He dives down, finds a big one, and then tries to sucker him in. We're out there in our snorkels, and he dives like 25 feet down. He's down there for a long time. I get around halfway down before my ears are going nuts, and I gotta come up and get some air. Two and a half packs a day. As so often is the case of debacles like this, after 20 rip-roaring minutes of pointless idiocy, we wrapped up this exercise and ran over to the nearest beach bar, where we ordered up the fabulous fiesta of frozen fish. At this point, I don't care if I'm eating Mrs. Paul's fish sticks. Food always tastes good when you got sand between your toes. Okay, I'm ready for the hot tub scene. So Leo's telling me that, that, that iguana is actually everyday food. He says every third day of his life, he goes hunting with the dog, the dog roots out an iguana for him, grabs one of these suckers, I guess builds him up, I don't know, we're going to have to get the story over again. So I decide to take Leo's recommendation and ask the host of our hotel to serve up this specialty. He wants to die, I mean, look at how peaceful he is. Let me describe eating iguana to you. First of all, you look at this leathery, wrinkled, nasty old thing and you're thinking, you know, that can't taste good. So he hands it off to his sister-in-law to cook. Maybe the worst thing I've ever eaten in my life. After stabbing it in the brain and roasting it over a flame so she can peel the skin off, they boil it in this scummy water. In one hour, it gets cooked. We can start making the tamales. And then they put it inside a tamale. It's like I unwrap this thing and it's like, what the f is that? What part do I eat? See, it's very tough. It's covered with skin. I feel the little bones inside there. And I need a sort of rubbery but chicken-like. 
It tasted exactly the way you would think. If you've ever kept fish, you know, when you clean your tank after nine years, that sort of nasty, greasy sludge at the bottom of the tank, that's kind of how iguana tastes. It was undercooked, and when I finally managed to suck a few strands of meat out, well, I'm sorry I did. It tastes like chicken. Unbelievably horrible. Worst episode ever. The cornmeal gets iguana taste. I just want to die. I mean, really, really bad. I want to dip my head into a bucket of lye after this meal. You know, pull my eyes out of their sockets and jump off a cliff. We're going to visit this woman, Dominga, who's famous for her traditional Oaxacan tamales made with banana leaves instead of corn husks. You walk in and the first thing I notice are the smells. The smell of incredible food cooking al fresco competes with livestock and animal dung. Flies are everywhere. There are chickens running around my feet and I'm thinking, great, what have I gotten myself into? Perhaps to ease my nervousness, she allows me to taste her mole negro that's been simmering all morning. Oh, that's really good. Oh, wow. I'm looking forward to this. Fantastic. <laughs> Dominga then gets ready to toast the banana leaves on a small portable stove called the comal. The comal is the flat surface they toast peppers, herbs, and things like that on. There are two ways of ma for making the leaves. You can boil them in the water or grill in the comal. I have banana leaves in my restaurant in New York. I use them for garnish. If you don't do this, they don't work. But you cannot bend them. They break. That's why you, you toast them a little first. You toast them, yeah. So we watched Domingo make about a zillion of these toasted banana leaves. Next was the arduous task of preparing the corn for a trip to the much-anticipated Molina. That's the corn called nixtamal. You have to wash it very well. Okay, we're going to the mill. This more than anything else is the reason that Oaxacans point to as the most visible reason why their region is special, because this is still a really powerful tradition. They bring their own chocolate, uh, their own corn, uh, coffee, uh, other dry ingredients, and even wet ingredients to the mill, and grind it up old style. This dates back to pre-Hispanic times. The mill is an essential facet of village life in rural Mexico. It's a big stone wheel grinding against another big stone wheel until the stuff is ground into a very smooth paste. The paste is added slowly to stock, simmers to make the final mole sauce. There are usually two mills, one for wet ingredients such as peppers to make mole, and another for dry ingredients like corn to make cornmeal. We watched Dominga grind her freshly washed corn into cornmeal. Dominga came earlier this morning to have her own peppers ground into paste for the mole we tasted just a few moments ago. Gracias. 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 So once Dominga gets back from the mill with her freshly ground cornmeal, she places it in a mixing bowl, adds some rendered pork fat and water, and mixes it by hand. So I heard some mas and maiz. It's the same? It's the same. It's the same. Once again, she checks the mole. The chicken, which has been simmering with fresh garlic and an egg, is now ready to be shredded. The smells are incredible. Next, she pats dry each of the toasted banana leaves and prepares the fire in her little shed to steam the tamales. I can recognize the steamer when I see one. <laughs> Finally, she's able to assemble the tamales with all of these amazingly fresh ingredients she's been preparing all morning. First, a little of the cornmeal paste, the masa. Then, a little of the chicken, topped with some mole, then tightly wrapped. Tamales are used for breakfast or for supper. Some serious heat in there. Next, Dominga steams the tamales for about 30 minutes. It looks like the tamales are finished cooking and finally ready to eat. Seems like Martin gets the first sample. Mm. Wow. This is living. Okay, that looks good. Yeah, that's not good, that's great. That's really good. Really, really fine. Good for hangovers? Gotta be. This is fantastic. Like no tamale I've ever had. Like years better than anything I've ever had in the past. Really good. Flies don't necessarily mean bad food. In fact, sometimes flies seem to indicate really good food. You don't want to smell animal dung where you're cooking, but it's not an impediment to a good meal. Dominga's a good example of this. Forget about every Mexican restaurant you've ever eaten in. But this is food. Fresh. Fresh and maybe original, old school way. We're we'll gonna have another one of these. A little piece, Mr. Pizza. Okay. Yeah.
place is supposed to be really good. It's supposed to be good. Yeah. Martin's heard about a great place for pozole. It's pork and corn soup, which I love. Pozole? Geez, those tacos look good. Look, I was going to have pozole, but, but these tacos are looking really good. And that looks like they chopped up head. Exactly. Jakes, now ears, exactly. all the good stuff. Clearly, popular joint. All right. Sometimes, street food is the best food. Pozole for the As you see, families flock here for a simple but hearty meal. This restaurant got it off. This is exactly the place I like to eat when going out to dinner. And just the type of companions I look for. This guy makes tacos faster than I can say tequila. It's the texture, the meatiness, the intensity of the flavor, and the freshness that make this the ultimate taco. The best pork taco I've ever had. It's wonderful. This is a good example, actually, of, of you go looking for one thing and you find another thing. Go oh, looking for Pozole. I found some really great King Hope tacos. And yeah, one more. <laughs> Martin's outdone himself. Show me all the good spots. So it's only fair I treat him to some friendly shots of mezcal. A close cousin of tequila. Now, what's a chaser they call? Sangrita. Sangrita. Little blood. It's a little blood. It's a little mezcal, a little blood. How's me? Sounds like a nice mix. Mezcal has the worm, you see? Right. Does that really work? We eat the worm? It's no, no, no. no. That, that's highly overrated, by the way. Yeah. Never did anything for me. Not they say the worm at the bottom of the bottle of mezcal makes you hallucinate. Okay, first, the line. Little mague worm uh, pepper. They don't just use salt. They use ground-up mague worms and salt as a condiment. Mmm, good. A hot sauce chaser or sangrita to kill the worm taste. My stomach's saying, what the hell? Let's do that again. <laughs> Let's see, why am I drinking this? Uh, to get drunk. To take the pain away and the humiliation. I see where this evening's going. Will I never learn? Never challenge a native to the local fire war. I start singing. Hit me with the nearest flight. Hit me with this and just drag me back to the hotel. myself trading shot for shot with Martin, but I fear that this evening will end badly. Despite my unfortunate foray into the world of reptilian cuisine, this has been a real learning experience. Mexican cuisine, in particularly Oaxacan cuisine, is complex and time-consuming, but it's worth it.